There are two stories in the canon that provide an interesting contrast. There's one in which Anandabhindaka is on his deathbed, and Sariputta and Ananda go to teach him. And Sariputta tells him about how to not be attached to anything at all, and he goes down a long, very thorough list of things to let go of. It even gets to the point where my consciousness will not be attached to consciousness as a training that he recommends. And then the Vindika starts to cry. And then is concerned that he's losing his grip. And, and then the Vindika says, No, it's just that for all these many years I've been visiting the Buddha and he never mentioned anything like this. And Sariputta said, Well, this kind of teaching is not normally given to householders. And Ananda Bindika asked, Could it please be given to householders? Because there are many of us out there who are suffering because we don't get this teaching. That's one story. There's another story where some householders come to see the Buddha and they ask him for a teaching that's appropriate for them. And he starts out with emptiness. And they complain, well, that's a little bit too high for us. And so he teaches them generosity and virtue. It's an interesting contrast. And it gets at an issue which is really important. Is we see many of the teachings in the canon are addressed to monks. And to what extent are these teachings appropriate for lay people? On one level, of course, they're appropriate for everybody, because the teachings say on dispassion. It's not that only monks suffer from passion and lay people don't suffer from passion. We all have passion. To what extent? And to the extent that we have passion, we all suffer. But to what extent can you apply that to your life? Well, in every case, whether you're a monk or a lay person, you start out by applying it selectively. Even monks who don't have that many responsibilities, that many attachments, they have to be passionate about some things. They have to be passionate about the training. They have to be passionate about the path. It's not like they deflate all their passions all at once. They'll have to learn how to be selective. So this is a lesson for lay people. You take the teachings on dispassion, and you figure out where to apply them, and where you're not ready to apply them. And there's also the fact that things don't happen immediately. You can learn about dispassion, and it just goes right past. You can think about contemplating death for a whole night, and then forget about it the next day. Lorna John saw what was teaching in, in Barry that time. He brought up the, the topic of body contemplation. And some of the people complained, gosh, if I do this for a week, I won't be able to go back to my partner. I wouldn't have any lust anymore. And John Sawat said, well, that's it'll be pretty amazing, just one week of this, and it's going to get rid of your lust. A lot of these teachings go against the grain, but they're skills we need to develop because the mind tends to go so heavily in the other direction. The things you have to practice. Meditation is like learning a second language. Our first language is attachment, it is desire, it is passion. But it's good to have practice in dispassion. Even if you don't go with it all the way. Or aren't ready to apply it that much to your life. It's like a good skill to have in the background. It's like having a second language. You never know when you might have to go to that country. And it turns out, in this case, this is the country we all have to go. And John Lee makes a comparison. He says we're going to have to emigrate at some point, leave everything we have behind, and go to another country where we'll need a wealth that we can exchange. In other words, we have to have generosity as our preparation. And he says, we also need a foreign language. And here the foreign language is learning how to let go. Aging, illness, and death come to everybody. They don't come just to monks or nuns. 
We all have to meet with these things. Separation comes to all of us. We all have to be prepared. So even if you're not ready to let go of everything, you want to learn the skills and how to let go when you need to. Just like if you're going to go to France, you don't wait until you get to France before you learn French. You practice beforehand. Because as we're sitting here, what are we doing? Thoughts come up when you have to put them down. They come up again, you have to let go of them again. Those skills are going to be really useful as you learn how to get better and better at that. And you want to practice it every day in the same way that you practice a foreign language every day. Because it goes against the grain, it's not quite the way you normally think. You start out practicing it as a game. You learn the grammar game and you learn the vocabulary game. And you learn how to make sentences just in the abstract, because there comes a time when when you go to that country, you're going to need water, you're going to need help, you're going to need this or that, the other thing, and you want to be able to say it. When I was learning Thai, the book that was used the very first time, I mean, it was a book that was written up for World War II, it was for American soldiers suddenly landing in Thailand toward the end of the war. First phrases were, hello, how are you? And the third phrase was, where's the bathroom? Because there comes a time when you're in that country, you're going to need the bathroom, and that's something you very much want to know. So it's the same here. There are a lot of skills you're really going to need when aging, illness, and death come. And they don't come at the end of life. Death comes at the end of life, but separation comes before them. Signs of aging come before illness can come at any time. Other disappointments in life can come at any time. You need to be able to keep your thoughts under control. You need to have that skill of dispassion. So as we get practice here, and this is why we call it practicing meditation, because we're practicing skills that we're all going to need as we go through life. That contemplation we do of being subject to aging, illness, and death, separation, and that we're the owners of our actions. As the Buddha said, this is something that everybody should think about every day, whether you're lay or ordained, man, woman, or child. This is something we all need to reflect on, because we have to be prepared for these things. At the same time, we have to learn how to think in these terms so that we don't get complacent or careless. As the Buddha said, when you think about these things every day, it helps you to abandon any unskillful behavior. Because our intoxication with health, youth, life can make us do all kinds of crazy things. The Buddha chooses his words carefully. It isn't a type of intoxication. We're drunk with these things and we can't think straight. So we have to sober up. At the same time, though, he says, when lay people and monastics think these, think of these reflections, they should go further. It's not just that you are subject to these things. Everybody, everywhere is subject to these things. The whole universe, think in those large terms. And that, the Buddha says, goes beyond just simply teaching you not to be complacent. It gives rise to a sense of sangwega, a sense of the terror and dismay that goes when you think about the way life can be so futile. Now, a lot of people don't like to think about this if they have jobs to do and other responsibilities. But it's good to have that in the back of your mind, because it makes you think in the larger terms, because when you're suddenly up against the larger issues, you want to be prepared. And it makes you even more careful about what you want to do with your life when you take on responsibilities, when you take on attachments. You want to do it deliberately. You want to do it with a sense of purpose, and not just willy-nilly take on things that are going to weigh you down. It helps give you a sense of priorities. 
It also gives you something of an escape, escape clause. It's good to be able to straddle the line between being in the monastery and being out in the world, if you're a lay person. As John Fung used to say, it's like learning how to be good both at Thai boxing and at what they call universal boxing, i.e. Western-style boxing. So when the world gets crazy, you've got a place to go. And you've got the values that go with this place, because the meditation is not just a technique. Although that is part of it, you are learning the skills of letting go. But right view is also a skill. The values about what really matters in life, these are the things that keep you sane when the changes of the world inevitably come. So when you think about dispassion, it's not just for monks and nuns. It's a skill that we all need, because we all suffer from the results of passion. The teachings on disenchantment, dispassion, release, even if you can't apply them all across the board, you want to learn how to apply them selectively. Look at what things in your life are causing you trouble, things that you can let go of, things you can put down. Learn how to do that. Get good at this skill. Keep practicing this second language every day, because there will come a time when you have to go to a country where this is the only language they speak. The more you can practice, the more prepared you'll be.